broadcast of this program is made possible in part by the South Carolina Farm Bureau, online at scfb.org. And by the Columbia Metropolitan Airport, online at columbiaairport.com. And by Time Warner Cable, online at timewarnercable.com. And welcome back to This Week at the State House. We have just about completed the third week of the new legislative session. Issues are starting to move toward the floor. The DOA bill that last year didn't make it through the Senate popped out on the floor yesterday and will probably get up for debate. Over in the House of Representatives, they've begun budget hearings and subcommittees and beginning to put together the framework for this year's state appropriations bill. Last week, we finished up having the legislative leaders tell us what were their priorities. Today I thought we would take a different perspective and we've got a program today dealing basically with um, some of the organizations across South Carolina. What do they see as their priorities? Before we do, we got some housekeeping things to take care of. Of course, I want to welcome my friends. Some of them on the set last week, 518 of the Block Building, Representative Merrill and Stavernakis, two fans of our broadcast. Um, we're always delighted to have them tuning in. Uh, but we also want to thank um, Time Warner Cable. We want to thank uh, the Columbia Metropolitan Airport. And also we want to thank the Farm Bureau, uh, South Carolina Farm Bureau, for sponsoring this particular program. Then to ETV, who produces it, uh, of course our thanks, and also to the South Carolina Press Association that helps us put it together and get it organized. With that, I got a special treat for you today because I've got three ladies who come to us with what's the gray tsunami, the doubling of the senior population over the next 15 to 20 years. What are the problems right now in South Carolina? What are the issues? Are these at the top of the legislative agenda with the governor and the leaders of the legislature? Are they their top priorities? What does it mean to you? to your mothers, your fathers, your grandfathers, and all of you, because nobody's figured out how to stop the time clock. So everybody will get a chance to be a part of a gray tsunami at some point. With me, Marjorie Johnson, Silver Hair Legislature, and I'm going to get her to tell you exactly what the Silver Hair Legislature is so that you'll have some idea. Next to her, Teresa Arnold, AARP. What is AARP? What is that acronym? Who are they? What do they do? You may know, you may not. And then Beth Sokowski, I hope I've pronounced that correctly. She comes to us from the Alzheimer's Association. Alzheimer's, what is it? How does it affect? How will it affect you? Let's start out. Legislative priorities for this year. The Silver Hair Legislature. Tell me, what are y'all's priorities and who are y'all? First, I'll tell you who we are. All because right. very few people know who we are. Whenever we go out to speak, People are wondering, well, are you real? Yes, we are real, but we are not real legislators. We are real in that we carry forward the wishes, the desires, and mostly the needs of senior citizens of the state of South Carolina. We are legislative enacted uh, uh, way back in 1999, I think it was. And we have 186 members statewide. We do an advocacy program. Uh, we are not lobbyists, but if you are one of our representatives, we will be on your doorstep to get our initiatives forwarded. Uh, we have three primary initiatives this year. And we have been fortunate in the past to get some of our initiatives forwarded to the legislature, and some of them have actually passed. This year, we're mostly interested in keeping seniors in place. 
We want them to age in place. And to do that, we are pushing for the complete funding of the community-based services. We also have an initiative for transportation for seniors. It is impossible to age in place if you can't get out of the place. You become a hermit. You become someone who is not really interested in life itself. You become disengaged. We want seniors to be able to get to doctor's appointments, to church, to the hospital if necessary, to the grocery store, that kind of thing. And we're pushing hard to get some kind of funding that will assure that seniors can get about. All right, very good. We're going to come back and discuss some of those. Um, we're going to move next to AARP. Huh? Tell us who y'all are and your legislative, some of your legislative priorities. Well, um, AARP actually doesn't stand for anything anymore because we have so many members who are not retired. Really? <laughs> yeah, so it's just the, just the initials. But um, we have about 565,000 members in South Carolina. Uh, we represent people 50 and older. We're a membership organization that um, is very interested in advocating for positive social change. And of course, for us, the top priority is to keep all of us vital and uh, living independently as long as possible. And I think that's a very doable goal, especially with your leadership over the Office on Aging. We're very excited about um, your hearing yesterday, your budget hearing, and in which you very eloquently Good. laid out the plan for um, how we can help people remain independent as long as possible. Very good. Alzheimer's Association, tell us about it. Sure. Well, the Alzheimer's Association is a nonprofit organization. We're here to support people who've been diagnosed with memory loss, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and their caregivers because the caregivers take on so much of that care themselves. And our legislative priorities really reflect that emphasis. Over 70% of caregivers for a person with Alzheimer's are family members, and they're doing it on their own. They're not getting paid. They're not getting help. And that can be overwhelming. Um, our number one legislative priority is to restore funding to a dementia caregiver respite program. And respite means assistance, essentially. Um, it's an opportunity for family caregivers to take a break, to get to their own doctor's appointments, to do their grocery shopping, to go get that haircut, to get out of the house for a few hours because caregiving is a 24-hour job. And the longer that we can support those caregivers in that role, the longer we can delay placement in more expensive levels of care that people might not need yet. And most seniors we know do want to stay in their homes, so we want to support them in that. We're also really excited about the agenda that your office has laid out this year and we'll absolutely be supporting that and supporting a lot of efforts in home and community-based services. And, and then let me follow up with you because I, you raise an interesting point. Somebody out there might say, well, how, how does that translate back to the state in cost? Why should the state reach out? Does it save money for the state? So for middle class families and, and lower income families out there struggling with Alzheimer's, I, I have met anybody that, that just wants to go to an institution. They, they all want to stay at home. Mm -hmm. How does respite care help save the state money? Well, by supporting those caregivers who are taking on all of that work, we're helping them stay healthy longer. We're helping them maintain good mental health and physical health so that they can keep doing that, to do what they want to do, provide for their family member, but also honor their family member's wishes. And by delaying nursing home placement, we're not only reducing those much higher expenses for the state if people do have to rely on Medicaid for long-term care, but we are also making sure that those beds are available for people who really need them at the time of their need. We kind of have both things going on. We need more support in the community, but we also don't have nursing home beds for those Medicaid patients when they need them. There's a waiting list. It's hard to find a placement nearby. It's really difficult for families to continue caring for their loved one if they're placed two hours away from their home. So would it be a fair thing to the people out there to say that when you're able to keep someone in their home independent and function mm -hmm. despite Alzheimer's or senior uh, type um, 
complications, like loss of mobility and things like that. Today they can protect their assets longer and if they go into skilled acute nursing care mm -hmm. at eighty to $110,000 a year, they'll quickly go through their assets and end up on Medicaid and that's $52,000 a year. So if you can do it for just hundreds a year, doesn't that kind of make good fiscal sense? It's I mean, simple math. Absolutely. It's simple, simple math. math. Yeah. And a lot of people just aren't prepared for long-term care. No one wants to think about needing to rely on others to provide care for them. So a lot of us don't financially plan for that. A lot of us don't have long-term care insurance. And a lot of seniors or uh, pre-seniors assume that when they become seniors and are eligible for Medicare, which is for that senior population, that that's going to pay for their long-term care, when in fact it doesn't. It continues to pay for their doctor's visits and for their medicines, but it does not pay for someone to stay in a nursing home, and that's outrageously expensive for most families. And so what we see is more and more middle-class seniors are having to rely on Medicaid, which is really there for the very poor but a lot of us are becoming very poor and trying to provide that long-term care. All right, let me go back to the issue of transportation, seniors, uh, mobility, people who lack mobility. We've had reports and, and, and the volunteers have come in and in, at least in one section of the state solve some of this. But some of these folks without mobility, they have, they're only companions of pet. Mm -hmm. They share what meals they get with their pet. They can't get to a supermarket. And some of y'all have looked at the interesting concept that some seniors are reticent about helping another senior go somewhere because if there's a traffic accident, their meager assets are at risk with insurance. And there's a concept of if, if it's just ordinary negligence, limit the liability to whatever their insurance coverage is so nobody gets wiped out. Right. And do y'all think that will help get it, a volunteer way to help seniors helping seniors, because I've seen seniors helping seniors across the state. It's a serious problem. It is very, very important that those persons who are willing to step forward and say, well, I have a neighbor next door, one across the street, one two blocks away. I will coordinate where they're going. I will take them. I will do the gas, the car, the whatever. I am insured. It's important that they be able to do that without the threat of having their insurance become liable for something that was unavoidable. If they are negligent, that's one thing. If they are just driving and an accident happens, they need to be only held accountable for the limits and the maximums of the insurance that they cover, that they have. Uh, that is becoming a problem with those people who are willing to volunteer today because they are afraid that there will be an impact on their own personal car insurance. So we're having a problem in that area and we would like to push the legislature into saying there will be a limited liability according to the insurance that is covered and nothing extra. A person can't say, well, he was or she was carrying my grandmother, my aunt, my whatever, and they were in an accident and her neck was broken, therefore I'm going to sue that person who volunteered to carry her somewhere. All right, sue, but you get what the insurance will cover, not the whole house, car, everything, which is what will happen today. And uh, let me ask you from <laughs> AERP standpoint, and, and if I'm wrong in my assessment, tell me I'm wrong. But you know, I've listened to everybody, and, and I don't mean to beat on them because I'm not. They're good people, they mean well. But I don't see in the speeches on legislative priorities, and state of the state and everything, Senior issues is a category. Some of the things that y'all are telling me that are priorities to y'all. Uh, any ideas on what we can do to, to build that awareness, to get these good folks to join with us and say this is a top priority? The great tsunami, isn't it real? I mean, is, am I wrong in that terminology of what's coming? I one, what you can do. Your video that was presented yesterday 
to the Finance Committee. Everyone should have the last frame. Look in the mirror. If everybody in the room who has a vote can be made to believe that if you're not there already, you're headed. If you have an accident on the way home and you are financially okay, you might not be financially okay next month because your savings, your everything can be wiped out just like that if the situation calls for it. Everybody in the room needs to know if you are lucky, everybody doesn't become aged, but if you're lucky, you will be old one day. You will at least be golden haired. Uh, and if they realize that, maybe they can see, maybe I'd better look out for my own future. My own future lies within the programs that they are trying to push. And everybody has to buy in. If you can't get them to buy in and look in the mirror and see uh, the gray is beginning to show, so you're getting there. If they, can't, <laughs> if they can't see that, then they have no nickel in that dime, if I'm making sense. You are. I, I, I think that they need to know that. Everybody ought to have a copy of your video. Oh, thank you. Ms. Arnold, yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you, and, and, and from your perspective, and, and if I'm wrong, say so. We got 8,000 on our waiting list for home and community base. We're short on funds. Mm -hmm. We have people that one meal a day because they can't prepare them, they can't do them. And it's where a different organization, Meals on Wheels, may help. Home delivered meals helps. In another. We complement one another. We're faith based. Are we prepared for what's coming? Are we prepared today for what we have and for what's coming? And if we're not, doesn't that command a message to policymakers and leaders across the state? Do we need to elevate this issue? I completely agree. Part of it is that for our legislators to understand that it's an important issue, their constituents need to let them know. So that's a burden on, on our organizations to educate the public about this issue and to let them know what they can do to advocate for senior services. Um, the only money that I'm aware of that the Office on Aging has gotten from the state in, in eight years that I've been at AARP is the 2.9 million that we got one time. And that has been cut and then restored. But that's basically all the money that they've gotten. And prior to that, I don't think we got any money for 10 years, a decade. So clearly, we're not preparing the way we should be. We're 38th in the country for our uh, treatment of long-term care issues. A hunger study that AARP did with some other groups shows that in our state, for people 60 and older, we have the fourth highest rate of people at risk for hunger. And in that same study, it shows that if you're not getting proper nutrition, you end up at the emergency room more And that's often. a lot of big cost, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. So, so if we turn blinders and look away, mm -hmm. It's like my daughter not paying her parking tickets. They go up and up, and she thinks if she's not looking, it won't happen. But it does happen, and we need to address it. And the things that we do on the front end that cost so little can make such a big difference. I have to tell you just one story of a small business owner right here near the State House who worked up until he was 81 years old. And a few months ago, he didn't show up for work. And the security guard went to check on him. And his uh, diabetes had gotten so bad that he really could not even get out of the house. And the security guard called me, and I called our senior resources, the services at the Office on Aging Funds, and this gentleman is improving, his health is improving, and he's able to live a better life in his home because of those services. And it, it just pointed out to me right at the heart of what we're doing, mm -hmm. is that we can help people. He's, he's, able to be independent. If he had not been able to get those services, the meals, a personal care aide coming in and checking on him, uh, the transportation to the store, he would qualify for a Medicaid nursing home. And think about that. $52,000 a year yes. versus 1400 a year to keep him in the home. And you multiply him 
It's, as you said, 8,000 times. We've got people on the waiting list that we need to be serving. So, um, isn't it true, and I'll start with you on this, isn't it true, and our viewers need to know this, Medicare does not cover long-term care. That is the truth. Medicare does not pay for long-term care. Medicaid pays for it, but you you have to lose everything to qualify for Medicaid. Mm, yes. And furthermore, who uh, has a goal in life to end up in a Medicaid nursing home bed? Nobody I know <laughs> wants to end up there, and it's so expensive. Mm -hmm. So yes, the at any time, oh, and I'll tell you this too, they've done studies on states that have rebalanced their long-term care so that they're s spending their resources in the home and community more than the nursing home side, the long-term care institutional side, and they actually have slowed the growth of long-term care expenditures for their states. So we have, yeah, really good evidence that <coughs> As a state, if we follow certain policies, that we can we can actually be more fiscally responsible, and I, I think more compassionate to the young people and to the and to the folks of South Carolina. What can they do? Long-term care is not covered by Medicare. Is there anything any steps they could take right now that are good steps that y'all know of from experience with your membership as to what they could do to pre prepare? Any of you want to tackle that? One? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, the very first step is being able to talk about it. People just don't want to talk about that. And we see it a lot, especially in the case of Alzheimer's. You know, there's a survey last year that Alzheimer's is the most feared disease. People are more f afraid of getting Alzheimer's than anything else. Yes. And as a result, no one wants to talk about it. No one wants to plan for that possibility happening to them one day. But whether it's Alzheimer's or cancer or heart disease or whatever the health condition is that causes a person to need long-term care, if you're young enough, you can prepare for it now. There's such a thing as long-term care insurance. It's not as common as health insurance, but if you sign up in your 50s, you know, it, it is something that's affordable. If you sign up after that, it's not so affordable. Um, and you know, if you plan for that and put those policies in place and make sure those policies reflect your wishes, if you want to be able to stay at home, make sure it covers in-home care, mm -hmm. then that's one way to plan ahead. But if you're past that point and it's not really an option for you, um, you, need, you still need to have that conversation with your family. You need to put legal plans in place. You need to know what it is that you want and you need for your family members to know that too. So everyone can support you in that goal. But it all starts with talking about it. It starts with not denying health issues. Um, we see a lot of denial with dementia and memory loss because people want to protect themselves. They want to believe that it's not happening. People need to know what the warning signs are. If someone suddenly can't balance their checkbook anymore, if they're burning things on the stove and they've cooked their whole lives, if they're getting lost when they're driving in a neighborhood where they've lived for 50 years, those are things you need to talk to a doctor about. You can't just keep it quiet in the back room in the house. We have to be able to have conversations as families about these issues. Those, are, those are things that um, come so true to my heart in that I watched my mother change from a very proud, uh, straight-walking, head-up kind of woman mm -hmm. to a woman who just sat with her dress unbuttoned and all of that. First, she forgot mm -hmm. how to get home from the grocery store driving a car. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a federal employee all of her life and wound up not even recognizing me sometime. Mm -hmm. And so we need to talk about it early, yes. very, very early. And I saw the signs and I took the action necessary. But when you said that, uh, someone said, you have to deplete all of your resources mm -hmm. before you can get help. I know firsthand that is so true. That is so true. So, Danny. Um, there's some simple things people can do too, and one is to make sure that your home is livable, that you can get around in your home, and mm -hmm. that's not just a ramp out the front door. That could be grab bars, mm -hmm. getting rid of little rugs on the floor. There are lots of things to make our homes more livable yeah. as we age, and they're Don't very. Don't forget the bathtub. And the bathtub. Ooh. 
Grippers, <laughs> bars, mm -hmm. handles. Uh, my mother-in-law has neuropathy now and she can't feel her feet and so she has to have uh, those things such as in the bathroom that will help her get into the tub. Mm -hmm. But very simple, inexpensive, and uh, very doable. Um, there, so there's things that we can do to prepare and another one is the American Bar Association has a planning for your future toolkit that AARP keeps on hand at all times we keep in our office to give to people that um, talks about how to plan for your future and has uh, our advanced directives and how to pick a health care power of attorney, who should that person be, and really ask you lots of questions so that you can plan for the end of your life. Well, we're almost at the end of this broadcast. <laughs> Again, time has <laughs> is, is flown by. So very quickly, I'm, I'm going to start with each of you. For folks out there who are hearing these issues, they're confronting Alzheimer's, they're confronting aging issues, how can they get in contact with you or access a, a, a resource beside our office? So sure. I give you a chance to tell them where and how. Well, the Alzheimer's Association has six offices in South Carolina. We have a 24-hour helpline. It's 800-272-3900. We also have a website with all of our resources, including an application for that respite assistance for caregivers. It's alz.org slash sc. We also have a website at aarp.org and we have one for caregiving which has a lot of resources on it as well as aarp.org backslash South Carolina. You can find out what we're doing here in the state. So over here at legislature, I know you got more priorities than we have a chance to talk about today. <laughs> <laughs> How do they get a hold of y'all to have some input? Tell it's them. more complicated to get in touch with us. We don't have an office. We don't have a phone. We have my phone. Uh, we are a volunteer organization, so we don't spend our money, the little that we get, on that. But you can uh, get to us through your website. Uh, dial up the Lieutenant Governor's office, and there is a link to Silver Haired Legislature. We have a website, but it's long. All right. <laughs> And so we've got one minute left, and there's one last question I want to ask, so I know I'm leaving stuff out today. But very quickly, we'll double in numbers over the next 15, 20 years. We've got 8,000 on a waiting list right now. We've got Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, all of these things coming at us uh, here. Um, what can we do as a state to inform people of this challenge? Very quickly, in just a few words, if any of you want to chime in, we're almost out of time. I think first we need to remind those persons with the votes, and I won't call their names, that we are not a special interest group. We are 20% of the population, the voting population of the state of South Carolina. We vote most consistently. We vote every time because we feel it's a duty. Remember us. Put us on your agenda. And we're consistent on this program that we have to stay in our time limit. And I'm informed we're out of time. Thank you all. I wish we had more time. We'll be back next week with more issues here in South Carolina this week at the State House. Broadcast of this program is made possible in part by the South Carolina Farm Bureau, online at scfb.org. And by the Columbia Metropolitan Airport, online at columbiaairport.com. And by Time Warner Cable, online at timewarnercable.com.